look at the history that most of Gaza, 80% or more of the population there are refugees. Right. So they were already displaced one, two, multiple times in 1948, uh, again in 1967 in some cases, um, and then displaced within Gaza before October 7th. But then in 2005, when there was a big deal made of Israel withdrawing its settlements uh, from the Gaza Strip. And one of then Prime Minister Arya Sharon's uh, advisors, Dov Weisglas, said infamously uh, about the restrictions placed on Gaza in 2005, the idea is not to starve Gaza, but to put the people on a diet. Yes. And they began counting calories. Mm -hmm. They began limiting the amount of shipments in. They began, so there's been a blockade on Gaza for almost 20 years. Welcome to the Stones Cry Out Delegation Summer Series of Webinars. And I'm delighted that you all can join us. My name is Doug Thorpe. Um, and delighted to have David Wildman um, joining us today. Um, uh, just shout out to um, all of our sponsors. Yeah, so so David, um, David Wildman serves as the main representative to the UN for Global Ministries, the United Methodist Church. Um, he tells me he's sitting in his office across the street from the UN right now in New York City. Uh, he is also area liaison to the Middle East and Afghanistan, has traveled to Afghanistan and the Middle East extensively for more than 20 years. He is the co-chair of the NGO Working Group on the Israel-Palestine at the UN. At Christmas, he participated in an ecumenical delegation to Palestine-Israel led by South African church leaders. It would be interesting to hear him say a little bit about that. In May, he participated in the Global Anti-Apartheid Conference on Palestine held in South Africa. Well, um, you know, from all that, David, I had the sense that you were older than you are. Um, <laughs> you've, you've covered a lot of ground in um, your 66 years, I think we determined. Um, so I was asking you this a few minutes before we started, but but I'd love for you to share a bit about this journey of yours um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, where you started out. And I, you talked about 1982 as a real watershed for you. So, yeah, just a little background before we dive into the current situation. Sure. Um, thanks, Doug. And thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks all for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate these weekly uh webinars it's a great chance for folks to gather and to share um so yeah briefly um uh, i first got involved in 1982 i was like active in the peace movement since uh, i was a teenager um in 1982 the un was holding a special session on disarmament uh and there was a folks may remember a march it was a million people that gathered in central park in june of uh of 1982 and one week before the march uh, the Israel invaded Lebanon to drive the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, out. Uh, and there was a devastating war. They marched all the way up to Beirut and uh, surrounded it. So as that started, you know, many of us were like, a war has just started. We should speak out about this. Um, but there were some of the organizers for the uh, freeze campaign to said, no, this march, this demonstration is only about nuclear weapons. No one will say anything about Israel and Lebanon, uh, or we may pull the funding for the event. And in fact, no one that day um, said anything from the podium, uh, from the platform, the stage, about it. But there was a few of us, a much smaller group that gathered at the Israeli consulate, which is around the corner from where I am now, it's a block away, and protested there. Um, you know, if you fast, I was in seminary at the time. So, of course, we were studying the Bible, which happens in the same <laughs> location, um, as many of you have read. And I don't think I'd really connected to the living stones, as people talk about at all at that point in my seminary career. But I sure sure as hell was worried about, like, what's going on. Um, if you fast forward through the summer, 
there was a negotiated ceasefire uh, that allowed the armed PLO fighters, Yasser Arafat and others, yeah. to be have safe escort out of Beirut to uh, Cyprus and then on to Tunis, uh, where they were for many years until uh, yeah. with the Oslo Accords, they were able to uh, return to Palestine, uh, to Gaza first and then to uh, the West Bank. Um, then in September, uh, after this horrendous slaughter and the safe passage of armed fighters, um, the Israeli military under Ariel Sharon stood by and allowed, lit flares and allowed the Christian phalangist militias to come in and slaughter over a thousand Palestinian unarmed refugees, uh, men, women, and children. Uh, and when I saw that and saw the silence of the churches and the silence of the peace movement, uh, or the vast majority of us, I was like, there's something wrong here. Uh, there's something that needs to be done. And that was the beginning of my journey to find out more about what was going on in Palestine and how to be in solidarity with Palestinians and all that wanted to end the horrendous uh, oppression and displacement and uh, dispossession that Palestinians have faced for so long. Yes. Yeah. So, um, You've been involved with the UN um, for years, you know, uh, you know, with with church connection. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit. I'm going to want to get to the church connection, but say a, a, a bit about your, uh, you know, association affiliation with the UN. You you've been in Afghanistan, many other places. Um, so just yeah, uh, what can you tell us about the role of the UN, um, especially, obviously, in Gaza and in Palestine? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a the question of Palestine, and it's framed at the UN as the question of Palestine, because it started in 1945 as British mandate yeah. Palestine, and the British government wanting to wanting and needing to end its mandate uh, and kind of turn it over to this new organization, the UN. Um, I'm not going to get into all the history, but since 1947, yeah, it's been the on the UN agenda as and the UN is is uh, it's 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 like a group uh, that I, I have given the term uh, caucasoids. <laughs> that they're they're a group. It's a club of governments, but they believe that you know. If you can't agree on anything else, can you at least agree to meet again on the same subject? <laughs> uh, so it's it's a kind of minimalist approach, uh, but but uh, and those folks who meet should be the ones who've done the most meetings. Um, so you can see where this is going with diplomat. Yeah. You know, there's, there's some diff limitations, but uh, the UN has been involved uh, since early on, not always well, and. Uh, there was the partition plan. I mean, the state of Israel was established by a UN resolution. It's one of the few states that was established by the UN, actually. Right, that's uh, right. Not only by the UN, there were like uh, groups on the ground, uh, terrorist groups and other armed militia groups that were fighting and democratic forces uh, to establish Israel. Um, but the plan was to establish two states. Yes. And that second state has never been established. Um, it's been resisted by uh, colonial powers, uh, empires, and especially by the government of Israel. So, you know, you fast forward in the after in the aftermath of 1947, the fighting of the Nakba, where 75 percent of Palestinians were displaced, the UN recognized that they needed both an immediate urgent need. And I think this like speaks to us today of where we're at now. You need and people are dying. People are being killed. People have been displaced and, and are refugees. What do we do? And so the UN Relief Works Agency was created to yeah. address one part of the immediate crisis. But then there was a political commission also created, which was like, we need a political solution that addresses the injustices and displacement that's taking place here in a genuine lasting way that will allow for just peace for all, all in the region. That political commission was undercut from the beginning and never given a chance to work. And we're still in that place today where UNRWA, the UN Relief Works Agency, is still the largest organization doing work on the ground mm -hmm. and yet is regularly vilified by the Israeli government, by right wing in the United States as well. Yeah. Um, but it's only addressing the humanitarian yeah. imperative. It does schools, health care. Uh, warehouses with food delivery, cash supplements, etc. It's it's the second largest employer in Gaza, 
Yes, uh, with 13,000. Yeah. The political part is still being struggled on and blocked systematically by the U.S. government in the Security Council. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there's an argument, of course, that, that Israel, that the paradox is that Israel relies on the fact that that um, with you know shutting down Gaza, that the U.N. will continue feeding, you know, doing the necessary work to to you know whatever minimum will keep people mostly alive mm -hmm. um at the same time that they're vilifying the UN, right? Yes. Fair enough. I mean, well, I think we need to look at the history that most of Gaza, 80% or more of the population there are refugees. Right. So they were already displaced one, two, multiple times in 1948, uh, again in 1967 in some cases, um, and then displaced within Gaza before October 7th. But then in 2005, when there was a big deal made of Israel withdrawing its settlements uh, from the Gaza Strip, and one of then Prime Minister Arya Sharon's uh, advisors, Dov Weisglas, said infamously, uh, about the restrictions placed on Gaza in 2005, the idea is not to starve Gaza, but to put the people on a diet. Yes. And they began counting calories. They began limiting the amount of shipments in. They began, so there's been a blockade on Gaza for almost 20 years. So when I, people talk about October 7th, but it was like, I was in Gaza in uh, October 2022, so the year before yes. uh, the sort of escalation of of October 7th and the last 11 months. And in October 2022, about 25% of Palestinian children under five were anemic. So the nutritional... Say that again, David, the numbers. About 25% of children under five yeah. We're suffering for anemia. Now, I, I've i suffered from anemia myself and know the level of like lack of energy and just not being able to get anything done. But for a child to suffer anemia, that stunts their their growth and has an impact for the rest of their life, potentially. Right. Um, now, at that point, they had UNRWA health facilities. They had other hospitals that were operating, not always with enough resources, but there were things that they could do. Um, and get them some supplements, some iron supplements and other kinds of nutritional supplements. Still, with all of that aid and assistance, uh, it was not enough. And that blockade from 2005 onward uh, basically transformed Gaza from a agricultural society, from an independent kind of a place that had the capacity to produce its own food, uh, to really flourish with factories and, and production into an aid-dependent uh, enclave of now over 2 million people because they can't export anything. And much of the agricultural lands are a closed military zone. I mean, a lot. I know a lot of folks are aware of these issues, but I think it's really important to remind uh, policymakers that, that this didn't come out of nowhere, that there was already a profoundly compromised, and it, October 6th, one day before, uh, there was a need for 500 trucks of aid delivery into Gaza when there was power, when there was a, hospitals that were open and operating. Now you have the whole of the infrastructure of Gaza destroyed. You need at least 500 trucks. Yeah. And Israel, by its own admission, has at most let in like 20% of that, uh, of the needs over the last 11 months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if I may, I'm going to make another plug here, David. There's an organization called We Are Not Numbers that I'm sure you're familiar with um, mm -hmm. um, that uh, uh, publishes stories from folks in Gaza. Um, and so it's, it's a good way to get some direct information and and support some of those 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 folks who are there. Um this is not direct. It's not where I was going to go, but but since we're here, um, um, I, I'm I'm curious about um, how how you respond 
to people who do not agree with you. Um, and there you're in New York. Um, where are you from originally, David? Uh, just north of the city. I moved into the city when I was 19. So, okay. okay. But so... New Yorkers will say I'm not really a New Yorker because, like, <laughs> No, of course, of course. <laughs> um, so, so you're not a Midwesterner. You're not from the, you know, North Dakota. Um, so, you know, if you get out into those territories, um, or in New York for that matter, right? I mean, um, people, of course, are going to say, "Well, Hamas." I mean, look what Hamas did. Um, how do you respond to to those statements? Yeah, I think, you know, there's not an easy way, but I, I what I would say is the most important thing for all of us that are advocates is to stay on message. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, it's like we're saying, what about Hamas? It's like, well, attack, targeting civilians is wrong. Categorically, the international law says you should not target civilians. But 99% of the children killed since October 7th are Palestinians. Yeah. That's so right. what's going on here? This is not, for those who like read the Bible, we're nowhere close to an eye for an eye. This is like, you know, 99 eyes yeah. for one. 95% yeah. uh, of the, of the all of the casualties, adults and children, uh, and over 70% of the casualties in Gaza are women and children. This is a genocide, and that's been that's. I'm not saying that lightly, and I'm happy to talk more about that. But the International Court of Justice has talked about this. Many legal scholars and human rights activists have talked about the five criteria in the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide as to why they're saying this, um, and what are we doing? So, like to me, it's like we but we need to hear people's complaints you know people's concerns because frankly the us media is so bad and we'll say hamas 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 so uh i'll just put this out there for folks um one of the fundamental problems uh i think in the united states is that we have this thing called a foreign terrorist organization list oh, yeah. that demonizes whole entities so you know you're the principal of a school you choose to join a political party. If that political party is registered as having done some terrorist activity and targeted civilians in certain cases, uh, should you be excluded from everything and vilified as a terrorist? So the, Hamas is not monolithic. The PLO is not monolithic. Frankly, Israel is a terrorist regime, I would say. It has done more killing of civilians than any other entity in the area. Um, and yet, we don't say that. Uh, we say it's self-defense. Um, okay. Actually, under international law, Israel has no right to self-defend when they are engaged in crimes of aggression, which is what they're doing in Gaza. Uh, these are crimes of aggression. And actually, the Palestinians have a right to defend themselves. They do not have a right to target civilians. But targeting military is a legitimate right under international law. Now, I'm a pacifist, so I look for what are nonviolent ways of being active and resisting. But I have to also recognize under international law that there are rights to defend oneself. Um, and so, like, we need to kind of unpack. Sometimes that's by questions. Uh, for those who folks who read the Bible, Jesus, the approach that he would take oftentimes, when, because folks were looking to trip him up. This was like Fox News was interviewing him all the time. You know, they were trying to yeah. say, like, well, let's gotcha, you know, little gotcha moments. Uh, he would turn it around and either tell a story or he would ask a question. So if I visit a mother-child health clinic where 25% of the kids are suffering from anemia, is that what's really a threat to the state of Israel? Is that anti-Semitic? Should that be bombed? Uh, a trauma healing center uh, that I also visited and has been hit and damaged, uh, destroyed, uh, for young girls that have been traumatized by multiple wars in their short lives. Is, is that a threat? Should that be targeted? That's what we're standing for. Um, and that's what needs to be defended uh, and advocated for. Um, yeah. It's, it's worth reminding people as well that if you go back to the 1940s 
and the establishment of what was an underground terrorist Israeli group that included uh, future um, prime ministers in Israel, right? So there's a long history of that. Um, yeah. um, I'd also just say that, you know, for those yeah. on the call that are Christian, Jesus says some tough stuff. And one of the things he says is first take the log out of your own eye. And when the U.S. is sending billions of dollars of weapons, arm shipments to one side, how yeah. dare we speak out? How dare we speak out yeah. about the violence? And my experience that I've learned on the ground, I think many others have been there, is 100% of Palestinians practice nonviolence every single day of their lives just to survive, right. to get through a checkpoint. You've got to negotiate with soldiers with guns to get to the hospital, um, to get to school uh, in Hebron. And now it's so closed down. Folks are afraid to travel just to get to work. Um, so that's why I say that, like, you know, where we might turn it around and say, where are the Gandhis and the Martin Luther Kings of the U.S. churches today <laughs> taking strong stance to stop the brutal crimes of our own government and yeah. our own administration that are engaged in aiding and abetting genocide? Yes. And I don't say that lightly. I mean, the Center for Constitutional Rights took an effort of a lawsuit against Biden and Blinken and Austin. Yeah. And it was thrown out like on technicalities on appeal, but with the judges basically acknowledging that likely the crimes that you're talking about were likely happening, but it's a foreign policy matter. So, you right. know, it's all the liberals love to hide behind uh, bureaucratic uh, technicalities as to why <laughs> we can't do more. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you've you've turned the conversation in, in a direction I wanted to go in, in terms of the role of the churches, and that's been a focus for you. It's actually um, uh, uh, Mark Braverman, who's on, on the Zoom call, um, has this uh, question. David, what is your view about the steep uptick in the weaponization of the charge of anti-Semitism, what it means politically and culturally? What do we in the church movement best direct our energies to confront it? a series of questions there, yeah. which gets us into the role of the churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the weaponization of anti-Semitism is an important kind of phrase, but I think it's also, I always acknowledge that anti-Semitism is a horrendous and historic and current uh, yeah. severe form of discrimination. And we in the churches and in the activist community are fighting discrimination. That's why we're standing with Palestinians to address the severe systemic apartheid discrimination that they face for decades. And so you have now frame it in a broader context of systematic discrimination. But when you're confronted with uh, Jewish supremacy in the same way we in the US are confronting and trying to uproot still white supremacy, it's not anti-white to challenge white supremacy. It's not racist to just challenge white supremacy. In the same way, it's also not anti-Semitic to challenge institutions like the Israeli state uh, that are systematically engaging in apartheid crimes against the whole people the pal of the Palestinians. Um, so it's not easy, and I think, you know, but what I would urge folks to say is you will be attacked. So if you're, if, if you're nervous about being attacked, um, then like, you know, just remain a spectator. Um, <laughs> and that will be complicit with the crimes that are going on. Uh, no, we need to kind of have a tougher skin, but also acknowledge the humanity of all, including uh, those that deeply disagree and those that are attacking us. Um, Jesus also says, love your enemies. Now, love your enemies is not just accepting what they say. In fact, you have to challenge and be creative about stopping the harm that they are doing, but do that in loving, creative ways. Um, and that's what the Kairos Palestine document talks about. The Palestinian Christians are some of the strongest advocates of saying that anti-Semitism is a problem, but it's a problem in a context of... Uh, broad systemic discrimination um, that are dividing people from one another and that we need to love our enemies and stop this cycle of uh, discrimination that's been going on for too long. 
Yeah, and and say more uh, about the connections between South Africa and Israel and the Kairos movement, of course, that has, in some ways, you know, flowed. Uh, I might say like a river organically from South Africa, really. So, yeah. Well, on about that. Yeah, I can say. I mean, I think many on the call, probably of a certain age, um, <laughs> are uh, were active in the anti-apartheid movement. So I was very active at the same time uh, that I was kind of in the eighties active on Palestine. I was also very active around South Africa uh, and working on divestment on three different campuses in the late seventies and and early eighties. Um, so I think BDS is something that grew organically out of many anti-colonial movements. So when you are people that are colonized by settlers, how do you resist that? They usually have overwhelming firepower. So armed resistance is sometimes you often used, but one of the more creative mass resistances is forms of boycott. So think of Indian struggle for independence in India, Gandhi and others, the salt march and the cotton boycott. There was a variety of boycotts that were used to resist um, British settler colonial rule. Uh, in South Africa, the boycotts and divestment were also very powerful. Uh, so I think one of the ways of looking at the Kairos document in South Africa and the Kairos document in Palestine was linking with these mass struggles of the people to resist this colonial uh, imposition uh, and suppression of the vast majority of the people. Uh, but then looking at the theological component of like, where's the church and all that and addressing church leaders. And I'll just say, you know, if you read the Bible and you do a little head count, most of the prophets are court prophets. They're very good at justifying and cozying up to power. They're usually not named, thankfully. The ones that are named are the are, are the bold, courageous prophets that are challenging that system of the institutional church, the institutional faith communities, being all too comfortable uh, with power. Yes. And uh, so I think it's like the Kairos moment is, are we willing to take a stand and speak out and act out uh, for the sake of the people, for loving our neighbors. And that is our way in which we express our love for God. Uh, it's not easy, um, but I'll share my, uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, scriptures, is Jesus's story about um, the need to pray always and not lose heart. So if ever there's been a time where we've needed to pray always and not lose heart, it's been this last 11 months where we're watching genocide and a hundred percent of what there's mass mobilization, student encampments, civil disobedience, um, Jewish voice for peace and uh, rabbis for ceasefire now. And others have shut down grand central station here in New York, uh, have shut down many other things. Uh, there's amazing work that's been done. And yet not all of that together has not stopped the Israeli slaughter and genocide. And it has not stopped the U.S. government from aiding and abetting and saying it's not, you know, the right of self-defense in the face of cruel aggression and genocide. Um, so we just need to be humble and say we have not stopped it yet. Mm -hmm. So we, we should not be hopeless. We should not give up, but we just should be at that not yet moment. <laughs> and and the, the story mm -hmm. that keeps me going is the story of the widow and the unjust judge. And many of you have heard me share this in Luke 18, mm -hmm. of the story of not losing heart um, and praying always. And Jesus, instead of like saying, like, here's how you pray, you fold your hands, you bow your head. It's like, no, there's a widow confronting an unjust judge and keeps demanding justice. And so the same way the widow, the, the, the fifth time, the 10th time, the 20th time, maybe the 100th time that she went to that judge, he remained unjust and she remained denied of justice. But at some point, I think, when she was making those demands, the judges in an oral tradition would be sitting at the market, at the gate by the wall. So like the Damascus gate in the old city in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. be sitting there where the markets are with all the vendors and all the people coming both from the, the fields, bringing their, their crops and the folks from inside the gate coming out to buy things. 
at the most public place is where she's demanding justice. I can't help but think that more and more of the folks in the crowd were like, what's she talking about? You know, she's got a point. Like, maybe we need to listen to like, you know what? You need to listen to her. And maybe they, you know, the story doesn't tell us what happens to the crowd, but something happened yes. that the judge decides, I don't want this to keep going here. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not going in a good way for me. She's going to wear me out. So I'm going to grant her justice just so she'll go away. And I think that that <laughs> notion of understanding our work of activism and solidarity with Palestinians for their rights is a ministry and a politics of erosion that we need to wear down the U.S. government, the U.S. administration. We need to wear down every politician that looks at their own self-interest rather than the sake of humanity, of children and people dying every single day, uh, being worried about being called uh, weaponized, you know, attacked as anti-Semitic, um, that we need to overcome those fears and join the widow, join the Palestinian. There's way too many widows today. Join the Palestinian widows, uh, the Israeli peace activists who are incredibly isolated, uh, but still uh, yeah. uh, Beth Selim and uh, Yashtin and other groups that are doing things as they can. Um, yeah, We need to join with them and take those risks uh, in creative ways. Yes. Well, and you just gave us a wonderful advertisement for the Stones Cry Out delegation going to D.C. because this is exactly what we're trying to do, what we were doing in March. Um, again, you just keep showing up, right? You yeah. just keep showing up. So, well, um, can I, can, Doug, if I could just yeah. interrupt for the for the Stones yeah. Cry Out for everybody who's going to D.C. Um, in September in a couple of weeks, uh, read Jeremiah 22. Uh that is um, the marching orders for lobbying. Um, I don't know if folks realize that, but Jeremiah was one of the early uh, lobby day advocates. Um, <laughs> this is what the Lord says, go down to Congress and the administration. Well, it's the house <laughs> of the king. You know, we have to translate the Hebrew a little bit here. Um, and proclaim this message. Hear the word of God. You who sit here in elected officials. Uh this is what you should do. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who's been robbed of their land, of their livelihood, of their rights. Do no wrong or violence to the alien, the fatherless, the widows, mm -hmm. and do not shed innocent blood. Jeremiah was the first one to come to the Biden administration and say, stop it. Like, stop it already. We need a ceasefire. Um, so just read Jeremiah 22. It goes on to compare two administrations. You know, you have to like work with the Hebrew a little bit. I've, I've had two little sure. Hebrews that just enough to make me dangerous. Um, <laughs> he compares two administrations, a, a father and a son. And Perfect. what this is, the previous generation, there was a generation, there was an administration that defended, this is verse 16. Uh, that defended the cause of the poor and the needy, and things went well. Is not this what it means to know me, says God? Yes. So I want, one of the challenges from Jeremiah is to challenge our elected officials, whatever faith they have, is like, don't say you're faithful and that you care about victims uh, if you're still shipping arms. It will be well if you stand when you stand with the people suffering the most is where you will find God in your midst. Yeah. Yeah. Mark added another note. Then, of course, there's Naboth. Um, um, and uh, remind me, uh, what's the story of Naboth? Well, there's uh, yeah, Naboth's vineyard in 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 King. Oh, that's right. And uh, you know, Naboth has one small little vineyard, and that's of course, right. all right, exactly, yes. And Palestinians, you know, have small, like olive trees that have been in their families for centuries, small fields, uh, and those are being systematically destroyed. And if you know, if people saw just the news today, uh, yeah. the worst military incursions by Israel in over 20 years, just this morning, in Tulkarim, 
the, the, the refugee camp was given four hours to evacuate. Yeah. The exact same dynamic. And the Israeli officials are talking now about the, you know, the kinds of tactics that we're using in Gaza, which we think were the most moral army, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're, we're, we're getting ready to use those tactics in the West Bank. I mean, these are, this is Israeli officials are saying this. Um, yeah. yeah. The largest operation, there was 150 soldiers just in Shufat refugee camp uh, today in uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, there's airstrikes in the West Bank. So all of this is gearing up to say, hey, you know, we've been getting away with murder, literally, yes. in Gaza for 11 months. Let's try it. Smotrich, Ben Gavir, Netanyahu, they're, all like, they're eager to do the same thing. Uh, across the West Bank, and I think Palestinians are very nervous about that. And we, we have an obligation in the U.S. to do whatever we can to stop the uh, complicity of the U.S. government with these crimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are folks, uh, some folks, uh, putting uh, messages and uh, and questions in the chat. So uh, please do use that. Um, and I, I also want to just call out. Um, in this context, the situation of Daoud Nasser, a tent of nations, because that's a microcosm of exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm saying this in part because I know that there are folks on this call who've been there, who know Daoud, know the family, um, and are concerned. So um, um, I, I did talk to Daoud about a week and a half ago, and um, um, the situation is just intensified 100% percent from what it has been for decades for Daoud, meaning that um, um, he is really protected by international visitors. When they're not there, um, the settlers are, I mean, literally just crossing the line, putting up buildings right along the edges of his property. Um, and so it is a very, it is increasingly dire. So, and yeah, when did you last see Daoud? Do you know, do you remember? Um, I, th I think I saw him at Christmas actually, because we were in Bethlehem and at several services. So I think I saw him at church there. Uh, yeah. I was not out the last time I was out at the tent of nations at the farm was probably in, in 2022, a year earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're, we're hoping that Daoud will be joining us at least on zoom, um, when we're in DC, if not even possibly in person. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, uh, I should just have, you know, a, a Mark, uh, a join us in conversation here. He asked, what is your sense of, what is Israel up to? Um, is it completely out of control? What's Israel's end game? And maybe you've just said that, um, they're clearly taking advantage of the situation in Gaza, um, in terms of what's going on in the West Bank. Well, I'll, sh I'll share a, a little anecdote from, um, a Methodist, United Methodist Bishop, right after 9-11, uh, we were gathering, and this was a, a Bishop, yeah. um, Bishop Minor, some of the Methodists on the call may remember, he was born in Germany, so grew up during, you know, as a small, uh, you know, as a child, during uh, the Nazi regime and the Holocaust. He then uh, was in East Germany and under uh, Soviet control uh, for quite a while until the fall of the um, Berlin Wall, and then served in Moscow uh, as the, the bishop there. And when he came to uh, the U.S. after 9-11, he said, um, you know, in some ways nothing's changed. I mean, this was a horrendous attack, but horrendous attacks have happened in many places around the world. Um, but what I wasn't prepared for was the level of totalitarian consent for violence within the U.S. public. Yes. And so he said, just remember that fascism is not the re repression of the majority. It's the consent of the majority in the repression of the other, whatever that other might be. Yeah. Um, and to me, those words still uh, ring very powerfully true that right now the majority of Israeli Jews support this fascist authoritarian genocidal war uh 
the hostages are speaking out against it. But there's a lot of, there's some internal dynamics within, I don't want to speak about the Israeli society, but there's parts of it coming apart at the seams. We'll yeah. see, but uh, it's this consent with horrendous violence, um, again, not only in Gaza, but in the West Bank, but also against the 20 plus percent, over 20 percent of, Pal of Israeli citizens who are Palestinians, that they are being targeted, uh, discriminated against even further than their you know, longstanding second class or third class status uh, within Israel. So what's happening? I mean, I think that Netanyahu is hoping that uh, Trump will win the elections in the U.S., of course. And so he's yeah. certainly going to keep, and that as long as war continues, no one will look at the horrendous intelligence and military failures of October 7th by the Israeli military and uh, and, and political leadership. Uh, no one will look at his crimes. Um, and uh, he can stay out of uh, court on his own, you know, sort of bribery and other charges. Um, the uh, coalition that he's part of, uh, Shmotrich and Ben Gavir uh, and other right wing, sorry, they're all right wing parties, um, but the extreme, extreme right wing parties, um, even the opposition are right wing parties, they're just less right wing. Um, so, in that context, they're like, this is our, we have a green light. We can do whatever we want, we can arm settlers. We can encourage them to just seize more land, to attack folks. They're not even afraid now of attacking internationals. Uh, so internationals have been attacked. Um, okay. So, but, so let's look at the U.S. election may not be decided November 5th. It might take a little while. Maybe the hostage families, some semblance of an opposition in Israel, uh, leads to a couple of members of Likud or one of the other parties to um, call for early elections, you know, that the government collapses. But it will still be a caretaker government, even if it collapses, for months before there's actually elections held. So the slaughter is all likely to continue unless the U.S. government does something. Yeah. So if the U.S. government said no arms, and uh, to quote, uh, I don't usually... Quote Republicans, uh, but you know, Secretary Baker, under, you know, in, in um, the uh, Reagan and uh, first Bush administrations, was a little frustrated with the settlement policies uh, of the Israelis, and he's like, "Look, you know my number. When you stop with all these things, call me. But otherwise, forget it. No money." Uh, yeah. They still were very supportive, but that, if the Biden administration would say, "This is it." Stop the war, get a ceasefire now, or you're getting nothing. No vetoes in the UN Security Council, no no uh, arms, nothing. Yeah. And so that's the, you know, we need to know how much. Now, I'll say one other story here. I got to like, um, and give a shout out since you have the judge from the uh, Samuel Proctor Foundation. Um, years ago, I heard Samuel Proctor preach. Mm -hmm. uh, he was at Abyssinian Baptist Church for many years here in New York in Harlem. Wow. And uh, a delightful little anecdote that I think describes the UN and the international community around Gaza. I don't think he, that wasn't what was in his mind at the time. But he said, you know, I was on the subway here in New York. It was really crowded during rush hour. There was a pregnant woman who got on and she looked like she was 10 months pregnant. She was like ready to like deliver right there. And he said, do you know... Not a single person got up to give her a seat. He said, I just sat there in amazement. <laughs> That's what the international community is like. One member state after another will describe the horrors of Israeli targeting of hospitals, killing UN staff, destroying yeah. infrastructure, you know, sort of cutting off electricity and water, uh, allowing polio to spread. And they'll sit there in amazement. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's with the U.S., there's active complicity. With yes. the rest of the world, there's verbal horror while they sit on the sidelines. Yeah. With and few exceptions. Uh, yeah. Do you have any hope at all with Kamala Harris and her vice presidential selection? 
Oh, I always have hope. Hope is, <laughs> let me just say, uh, Daoud Nasser's sister, Amal, hope. Uh, you know, Amal is the Arabic word for hope. Uh, yes. Hope is what you can't see. That's what yeah. Apostle Paul said. If you can see it, it ain't hope. Um, again, yeah. my Greek is a little rusty. Um, hope is what we can't see. So, of course, I have hope. But I'm also realistic that yeah. there are powerful forces weighing against Kamala Harris or anybody doing the right thing. I mean, look what happened to Jamal Bowman and look what happened to uh, Corey Bush. But it took tens of millions of dollars to unseat two folks. That's not a very cost-effective approach, I might right. say. Um, but my fear is that what some, mainly Democrats in Congress and the vice, and Vice President Harris's campaign recognize the humanity of Palestinians as long as they stay victims. So like, yes, we want to restore funding to UNRWA or have funding through other channels like the World Food Program. We understand the suffering. We want to make sure they get polio vaccinations. Uh, but but don't start getting uppity and talking about rights now. Uh, don't do that. Like, uh, Palestinians can't speak for themselves, for instance. at the I mean, that was just a horrendous decision by whoever made the decision not to allow a Palestinian to speak for themselves. And I think we need to always insist that Palestinians are more than capable of speaking for themselves, what we need to do is listen. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a note from uh, John Paulberg, uh, who reinforces what we were saying about Tent of Nation. I was at Tent of Nations last week. Israeli settlers have put up caravan just feet from their property line, make frequent incursions. So again, just reinforcing. And again, that's a small slice of what's happening all over the West Bank at this point. And Doug, uh, if I can just yeah. interject, this is Mike again, but if I yeah. could just in interject, uh, um, uh, John Parlberg uh, was with us in February and March on the first Stones Crowd delegation. And as he said, he was just there. He was with the Christians for Ceasefire uh, mm -hmm. delegation with uh, Eli McCarthy and, and a yeah. bunch of church leaders. And he was right on uh they were in, they were uh, at the border of Gaza, and they were really putting their uh, putting their their lives, uh, um, right. you know, between settlers and Palestinians, and really doing the good work. So shout out to John. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Mike. Yeah. And, and David, we've got just a few minutes left. So um, say something about the role of the churches and what we haven't done and what more we can do um, in this context. Um, um, you know, again, you were saying, um, I think maybe before we started about, well, you know, there are folks like Eli and others, you know, who uh, have feet on the ground, but it's not necessary um, to go there to do important and good work, right? So, yeah, talk about them. That. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, um, there's a way in which many of us who've been active in this, uh, you know, want to be close to the action because that makes us feel like we're making a difference. And so uh, Palestinian Christians, the Palestinian community at large have called for folks to be present in solidarity. And that's an important call, but that's one part of it. And all the Palestinians that I've talked with is like, you need to change. If you're from the United States, the linchpin in all of this is the absolute support of the U.S. government for the government of Israel. That needs to stop. We can't get visas to come to the U.S. Uh, you've put us on all these lists, no fly, etc. cetera. Um, so you need to confront your own government. And I would challenge everybody to say that uh, you need to do 90 percent of our work needs to be confronting the U.S. government, confronting U.S. corporations, uh, the um, cities for ceasefire has begun to use and mobilize uh, municipalities, uh, city officials uh, to challenge the military industrial complex. Because, you know, frankly, the money circle uh, of military, you know, all those billions of dollars of arms shipments to Israel that are funded by our U.S. tax dollars, are profits for U.S. companies. And so yeah. we need to challenge them and stand with the students 
I love what the, um, I think the churches could take a lesson from the University of Michigan Student Senate. I don't know if people have seen this recently, but they just announced, uh, they actually ran last spring as a shut it down party. And they got like half the student senate and the student president. Um, and so they said, we are freezing all funds to all student groups until the administration and the trustees divest uh, from companies providing arms and, and uh, support to Israel. Uh, and so <laughs> churches could stand with the students. I think a really important thing now is not for us to say, well, we let's tell the students what to do. Yeah. Students know what to do. They're active, amazing work on campuses. But did we show up to say, we're standing with you? If you need sanctuary, we've got a congregation across the street or down the street. Uh, please use our facilities. When if you're if you've been thrown off campus, we welcome you. Um, and use that notion of sanctuary, uh, express solidarity. Um, you know, there's varieties of ways of doing that. Um, me, you know, we have to keep being a thorn in the side. You know, a sojourner truth said to be a flea. Um, you know. Uh, what if we discuss the flea is the, our example of like the model of the church is to be a flea, you know, <laughs> to, to keep the powerful scratching. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that seems like small and, you know, so think, think about, so the abolitionist movement and, and sojourner truth and the underground railroad, like I can only imagine like feeling like what difference is this making we're not shutting down the system of slavery but for the people involved it was a huge difference to say this doesn't need to last the system is not unchangeable and so i think whatever we're doing in small ways uh, not everybody's going to be able to go on a delegation or be involved with uh you know the community peace teams uh, and things like that international solidarity movement uh the ecumenical accompaniment program of the world council of churches uh, not everybody's going to make it to Washington, but there's something we can do. If there's a campus, connect with the students, but listen to them. Don't like yeah. connect in a way of like trying to tell them what to do um, and have the tough discussions. Uh, if there's interfaith work going on in your community, insist that the Muslim community be a part of that. There's been way too much Jewish Christian dialogue that's been uh, dialogue to silence Christians taking strong stands on Palestinian rights. Um, but the Muslim community is besieged. They're the first folks that are going to get targeted and are already being targeted. Um, so I would say that's another thing is, you know, there's um, a number of groups that have been very powerful of standing with them uh, as they're facing discrimination and students are, are losing jobs. So th those are things. And Mutter Isak said this in all his speeches, is like what happens in September on the streets and on campuses is far more important than whatever happens in November in the United States. That's powerful. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I encourage people to, to read. There's a, a lengthy note on the chat uh, going back actually to one thing that Ronald Reagan did, um, um, just literally called Prime Minister Begin um, and said our relationship is at risk over what's going on in Beirut. Right. I mean, so you know, that's the highest level. Right. And um, and what you're saying is that our our task, you know, uh, I, I'm not I can't call up Kamala Harris and have a conversation, but we can be a flea right on the back, which is exactly, again, what we're hoping to do in Washington, D.C. Um, so speaking of D.C., you know, uh, and I think you've alluded to this in terms of your com uh, comments about the role of the churches, but. Anything in particular, any advice for us when we're there in D.C.? You know, how can we be most effective? Well, I'd say, you know, talk to folks, talk to the staffers. There's a lot of staffers that are very upset with what's going on. Yes. But so your presence, our presence, it partly affirms, like, keep at it, like, um, the Many offices, the vast majority of message, hundreds of thousands of message of phone calls, emails, letters are saying we want a ceasefire now. I think the important thing is we'll get a ceasefire if there's an arms embargo. Right. So the big yeah. message to Congress is it's not enough to call for a ceasefire. The precondition that's necessary 
absolutely necessary to implement a ceasefire is an arms embargo by the United States. Yeah. Um, and that's good for everybody. Uh, yeah. Except yeah. for the, well, the military contractors probably will not be so happy about that. But. Right. And let me just say, I want to invite folks to consider years ago, Martin Luther King talked about the military industrial complex. Eisenhower talked about it. Could we just say that it's time for the military industrial complex to die? And that in the churches, our job is to provide a hospice program to kind of that our visits to Congress are part of pastoral calls to call people back to account. I mean, after 9-11, Barbara Lee was the only one willing to speak out. So now we have a lot more than that. Uh, we had 100 uh, Democrats that did not show up, uh, one Republican, I think, um, when Netanyahu addressed uh, a war criminal mm -hmm. address Congress, and they celebrated that. Um, yeah. So let's appreciate that and say, but what more can you do? Uh, yeah. And encourage folks, like we all need to think of what's the extra mile. Um, I'll, I'll close because I know we're at the hours. When yeah. I was there on the Christmas delegation uh, in Bethlehem and Jerusalem, uh, I then went on to Egypt to Cairo and met with a couple of uh, Raji Sarani and uh, Issam Yunus, who were heads of the Palestine uh, Center for Human Rights and also the Al Mezen Human Rights Center that are based in Gaza. They had gotten out last fall in November and then uh, in December. And uh, Raji challenged me. I mean, it's used like the uh, Christian language is um, the head of UNRWA is going the extra mile. He's visiting Gaza. He's pushing. He's demanding a ceasefire in order to do the humanitarian mandate. And UNRWA is being vilified and attacked. He said, what's the extra mile we all can do? Mm. And to me, that's the challenge for us as the church, churches, uh, as activists. What's the extra mile that we can do? And that's different for each of us. But let's all be looking for that extra mile of activity because that's what together will... Uh, reach a ceasefire and shut down the genocide and begin to allow for Palestinian uh, self-determination and for a just peace for all. Yeah. Okay. Um, and David, uh, again, my deep thanks. Um, it has been very powerful and uh, just so important. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, anything finally you want to say? Yeah, I just, I saw in the chat, somebody said, Can repeat Munter Isak's quote. And it, it's what he said to students and to churches is like what happens in September in the streets mm -hmm. and on campuses is way more important than anything that happens in November. And of course, you know, the yeah. U.S. election. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember that what we can take responsibility for is getting to the streets and so I would urge us, there's a lot of activism already going on by all the folks on the call already and the groups that are our sponsors here. Um, but help folks look at the approach of like a both and. Um, don't like, you know, this is like, well, we can't do a trip. So what can we do? No, no, no. Do the trip for those who can do that. Do lobbying for those who can make it to D.C. or writing or calling. Keep calling. Be like the widow, which is not once, twice. 10, 100 times, just keep doing it, but also boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, those are biblical. I don't have time to go into all that, but uh, over and over and over again, those are great nonviolent actions. Uh, boycott the, those organizations that are complicit and going along with this ongoing genocide. Divest and push universities and our churches to do more divestment and sanctions, which has pushed the U.S., uh, and the UN to adopt sanctions and arms embargo. Um, because those are all forms of nonviolent action. Um, I think we also need to like name apartheid. So there's the apartheid free communities uh, yeah. movement that AFSC has uh, sparked. And there are many congregations because uh, our congregations uh, need to be more active. But just thanks. I mean, Keep, everybody keep at doing what we're doing uh because you know if you if we're reaching like the playoffs the, the end of the baseball season but for folks <laughs> that like baseball you know the guy who struck out three times and comes if he, he hits a home run the fourth time 
he wouldn't hit the home run if he didn't show up at bat the fourth time. Um, right. And so I think that like whatever the metaphor that works for you, like join the <laughs> widow. Um, and then last is the, I always read First um, uh, Peter 3. Uh, is a powerful message to uh, refugees. You know, the beginning of Peter is like a message to the exiles. Well, that's, that's like biblical language for refugees and displaced. So he says like, don't fear what they fear and do not be intimidated. And I think so often we start to fear what others fear. We start to be intimidated. Like, how can I speak out? Well, speak out and get slammed, but just no, don't do it by yourself. You know, <laughs> uh, but always be willing to give an account for the hope that's in your heart. And for Christians, it's Jesus. But it could be the hope that God has placed that we all have when we work together. Uh, because when we're stronger together, like that crowd that joined the widow, <laughs> we can move even the most unjust of judges. So thank you all and uh, blessings on the ongoing work. Again, thank you so much, and thank you all for uh, joining on the call. And um, um, keep up, keep up the good work. Bye, bye, all.